Clover is scary precisely because we know so little about it. From the area formerly known as Central Park, that doesn't bode well. You'll notice an object falling from the sky into the ocean. We got like three seconds left. Their resounding cry is the simple question, why? This experiment could unleash chaos. The three Cloverfield films take place at three different levels in the cosmos. Clover is unleashed by humans attempting to create a source of unlimited power. Clover is what happens when we try to fix everything ourselves. New York City. Frenetic. Relentless. A 24-7 beating heart of human and mechanical activity. It feels as though nothing can possibly disrupt this juggernaut of business and leisure, which makes it all the more disorientating when it happens. Enter Cloverfield, the 2008 Matt Reeves directed found footage disaster movie in which a giant monster arrives out of the blue to unleash carnage on the city. The evocation of 9-11 is hard to ignore. Skyscrapers topple, iconic landmarks are torn apart, and countless New Yorkers' lives are either claimed by the destruction or turned upside down. Is this bad taste on the part of the filmmakers? Well, it's worth noting the sheer number of pre-9-11 Hollywood disaster movies that depict the destruction of New York City. Why did they always use New York? Well, nothing seemed to evoke global disaster better than the sight of this iconic city being threatened. And that was actually central to the sickening symbolism of Osama bin Laden's attack. With 9-11, he brought real-life destruction to New York on an unprecedented scale. Onlookers were left utterly shell-shocked as they witnessed sights that they had previously only experienced in the movies. And now, disaster movies can't help but evoke 9-11, because 9-11 itself was designed to evoke disaster movies. There's plenty more to say on the ethics of making a film like Cloverfield, but in this video I'll be taking the three Cloverfield films on their own terms and considering their symbolism. With that in mind, let's consider the central threat of the first movie. Created by J.J. Abrams and designed by Neville Page, the huge reptilian monster of the first movie became known as Clover during production. The film reveals next to nothing about its origins, aside from this piece of footage recorded from Coney Island before the start of the attack. If you look carefully, you'll notice an object falling from the sky into the ocean. We've got like three seconds left. What do you want to say? What do you want to say? Last thing to begin. I had a good day. The implication is that Clover is of extraterrestrial origin. Its belly is covered in parasites, each about the size of a dog. They are more nimble than their host, and if one of them bites you, its venom will cause your body to explode in a matter of minutes. Clover is scary precisely because we know so little about it, and thanks to the use of the found footage format, we don't see much of it either. Cloverfield tells us from the outset that it won't have a happy ending, because it's presented to us as camcorder footage recovered by the US Department of Defense from the area formerly known as Central Park. That doesn't bode well. We're watching a case file. The opening act depicts a leaving party for Rob Hawkins, who's about to move to Japan for work. It's clear that Rob is very much in love with Beth, but he ended the relationship in lieu of his move to Japan. Rob's brother Jason urges him to call off Japan and make things right with Beth. And then all hell breaks loose. She's crazy about you, bro. Like, right now. Yeah. As you and are. And you're in love with her. But you gotta go after it's her. It's not that simple. No, it is that simple. Come on, I'm... man. Don't be scared. It's about moments, man. That's all that matters. You gotta learn to say, forget the world and hang on to the people that you care about the most. <laughs> We'll now be entering spoiler territory. Amidst all the carnage and the resulting loss of his brother, Rob's priorities are brought into sharp focus. He decides to venture back into the city to find Beth. He doesn't expect his friends to come with him, but they do, with HUD conveniently recording the whole thing via camcorder. That's always the challenge of found footage films. You need to provide a story reason for why the camera continues to record. And Cloverfield handles this well. Hud was tasked with recording messages for Rob at the leaving party, and he decides to continue filming to document this nightmarish scenario. It's almost his coping mechanism. It gives him something to focus on. And every now and again, we catch snippets of footage of Rob and Beth on their trip to Coney Island from a few weeks earlier. That's what was on the tape before Hud started filming. 
from time to time it breaks through, interrupting the nightmare with brief moments of sunshine. You could see these as fleeting visions of the way things were meant to be. And eventually they locate Beth in her apartment on the 39th floor, injured but alive. They reach the evacuation point and Lily is whisked into a Marine Corps helicopter. Beth, Rob and Hud are whisked into a second helicopter. They become airborne just as bombers arrive to level the city. Evidently the threat is so terrible that the government has resorted to hammer down protocol, i.e. destroying the entirety of Manhattan. It's the only way to bring down the monster. The film could end here, with Rob and Beth clinging to one another in the helicopter as they make their escape. But Clover hasn't finished yet. It lands a blow on the aircraft, causing it to spiral out of the sky. In the face of what is surely imminent death, HUD makes an almost involuntary prayer. We don't get a sense from the film that HUD is a committed Christian, but he has grown up in a culture that has been thoroughly shaped by Christianity. The skyscrapers of Manhattan tower above the churches, but the churches are there, and they've been there for a while. When confronted with his mortality, some kind of latent belief or desire for belief in Jesus emerges from him. Remarkably, the three central characters survive the crash, or at least HUD survives long enough to emerge from the helicopter and come face to face with Clover. And that's that. For some reason, Rob picks up the camera and runs off with Beth to take refuge under a Central Park bridge. And this time, it really is the end. They record a final message for the world, and their resounding cry as they get buried beneath the rubble is the simple question, why? Why is this happening? I don't know why this is happening. <laughs> a subtle but important theme in Cloverfield is suspicion of the powers that be. Ocean is big, dude. All I'm saying is, a couple of years ago, they found a fish in Madagascar that they thought had been extinct for centuries. So what, it's been down there this whole time and nobody noticed? Sure, maybe it erupted from an ocean trench, you know? Maybe our government made this okay. thing. I mean, yeah. and, you know, maybe it was an accident. Sure. Or maybe, maybe it was they did. Does it really matter right now? 2016 saw the release of 10 Cloverfield Lane, a loose sequel to Cloverfield which leans into this theme even more. Our protagonist, Michelle, wakes up in an underground bunker built by a man called Howard and his assistant, Emmett. Howard claims that apocalyptic nightmares are taking place above ground, aliens or something else, and he has brought Michelle down into this bunker to keep her safe. How long do we have to wait until it's safe? Depends on proximity to the closest blast, one year, maybe two. And that's if we're, we're talking about weapons that we know of. Russians are developing some nasty stuff, and if the Martians finally figured out a way to get here, their weapons will make the Ruskies look like, like, like sticks and stones. But luckily, I'm prepared for this. What follows is a gripping, cabin fever-type thriller. Howard shows all the hallmarks of a wacky conspiracy theorist. Michelle has an instinctive desperation to figure out what's really going on, and if necessary, escape. Are there really aliens above ground? Or is Howard actually a dangerous man who wants to keep her in captivity? The answer, it turns out, is both. In 2018, a third movie was released, The Cloverfield Paradox, set in the near future of 2028. We have these astronauts aboard the Cloverfield space station, and the purpose of their time in orbit is to get the Shepard particle accelerator up and running. If it works, it will yield unlimited energy and solve the world's energy crisis. But that's where the third installment invokes the theme of conspiracy theory once again. This experiment could unleash chaos, the likes of which we have never seen. Monsters, demons, beasts from the sea. To clarify, you believe their efforts to solve the energy crisis might unleash demons. Yeah, and not just here and now, in the past, in the future, in other dimensions. This man acts as a prophet within the film, warning of the potentially apocalyptic side effects of switching on the Shepard accelerator. He claims it will open doors to parallel universes, unleashing terrifying monsters on Earth, not just in the present, but throughout history. It seems we now have an explanation for the monsters of the first two movies, which are set years before the events of the Cloverfield Paradox. 
It is perhaps a little surprising that this bonkers sounding man is vindicated in the film. He even has the same surname, Stambler, as Howard from the second movie. Perhaps the message is this, amid the constant noise of conspiracy theories and misinformation, there are legitimate voices for truth, and sadly even those are being neglected and ridiculed. It's a case of the boy who cried wolf. The three Cloverfield films take place at three different levels in the cosmos. Cloverfield primarily takes place on the Earth. Ten Cloverfield Lane takes place under the Earth. And the Cloverfield Paradox takes place in the heavens, in space. That's what's going on vertically with the franchise. And then there's another dimension, order and chaos. In ancient cosmology, space and time were seen as opposites, in conflict with each other. When space dominates, things are familiar, ordered, stable, unchanging. This might be reflected by a people group living at peace in their promised land, and not much happens, perhaps. When time dominates, things are chaotic, uncertain, restless. This might be reflected by a flood or a people group wandering in the wilderness or being carried off into exile. So the way ancient cosmologists thought of space and time is a bit like how we think of order and chaos. What happens when we apply this understanding to Cloverfield? Well, in the first film, situated on the Earth, chaos dominates. The city is thrown into total disarray and confusion. In the second film, situated under the earth, order dominates. For the most part, living in this underground bunker is frankly mundane. There's plenty of food and water, they could stay down there a while, but of course things quickly become unbearable with the suspicion, the cabin fever, the desire to break out of the box. Ultimately the order is short-lived, and the underground life turns into a chaotic struggle for escape. In the third film, situated up in the heavens, the goal is to find balance between order and chaos. The Shepard Particle Accelerator is a picture of this. It contains particles whizzing along with ridiculously high energies. But it's a circuit, it's a controlled, finely tuned environment. So the accelerator will only work if this fragile balance between order and chaos is maintained. The film tilts over into chaos when the Shepard overloads. As prophesied, this triggers the Cloverfield Paradox. The space station is whisked into a parallel universe, and the fabric of reality itself begins to unravel. In the parallel universe, there is a doppelganger of our protagonist, Ava Hamilton. But unlike our Ava, her children are still alive. This presents our Ava with a strong temptation to remain in the parallel universe, where there's a chance to protect her children once again. If they really can be considered her children, and we'll come on to that. The key turning point in the story is brought about by Jensen, a woman from the parallel universe who wants to hold on to the Shepard Accelerator. Turns out they are also facing an energy crisis. Ava defeats Jensen and comes to terms with the fact that she needs to go home but not before sending a message to her parallel universe self. I have to be quick. Attached to this message are detailed construction and operation plans for the Shepard Accelerator. I'm praying it helps your planet. I have the same hope for mine. Go to your husband and your children. Kiss them and love them and know how blessed you are to have them in your life. It's a powerful moment. Ava has learned that she doesn't belong in this parallel universe. It's not her home. Those aren't her children. But she shares with her doppelganger almost what she wishes she had known herself. Keep family close. You might very well find the Cloverfield Paradox's explanation for the monsters of the first two movies to be somewhat anticlimactic. Indeed, multiverse stories create all manner of problems. If there are potentially infinite parallel universes, the implications are confounding. Because in some universes, I'm alive. In other universes, I'm dead. In some universes, I'm more evil. In other universes, I'm less evil. It's a pretty alienating concept because it means that in a sense, everything is true in one universe or another. And paradoxically, that makes life less meaningful. There isn't a single story to bind all of reality together. It's everything everywhere all at once. The past decade has seen a proliferation of multiverse stories. I think they reflect a kind of cultural fatigue and hopelessness. The internet really is everything everywhere all at once. We're being numbed to the world around us by overstimulation. 
we feel insignificant. But here's where the Cloverfield Paradox has something to say. Because by the end of the film, the Shepherd Accelerator is actually working. The energy crisis has been solved. But the monsters remain. And they are so horrific that Ava's husband doesn't want her to come back to Earth. She's safer in space. You're having her come back to these things. There's nothing we could do. They couldn't stay up there. Michael, there wasn't a choice. There is a choice. Tell them not to come back. That's a profound reflection on the human condition. We can't seem to solve our biggest problems. It's like the bubble in the wallpaper. Just as you push it down to get one patch under control, it pops up somewhere else. The Cloverfield Paradox places human beings at the centre of its cosmology. Things go wrong on the human level, and the fallout ripples across the cosmos, across time. Humans solve the energy crisis, but in the process they unleash something worse. It seems that we ourselves cannot be trusted with the unlimited power of the shepherd. But we do need a shepherd. In the Cloverfield franchise, the heavens seem to be silent and uncaring. But there's still a sense that humans matter in the affairs of the cosmos. There's a relationship between humans and all of reality. And we see that relationship going wrong. The word monster is derived from the Latin words meaning to demonstrate and to warn. And historically, that's how humans have thought of monsters. An example is the beast of Gévaudan. These giant wolf-like animals reportedly attacked southern France between 1764 and 1767. Now, whatever you make of that, it was interpreted by many as a sign, a warning of the consequences of war as empires expanded across the globe. These monsters were effectively saying, you want destruction this is what destruction looks like. Are you sure you want this? And maybe that is a possible interpretation of the monsters in Cloverfield. Clover is unleashed by humans attempting to create a source of unlimited power. Clover demonstrates the monstrosity of our own ego. Clover is what happens when we try to fix everything ourselves. That's not to say that the people who die in these films deserve to die and that Clover is the good guy. Not at all. We're rooting for the human characters in a truly awful situation. We want them to escape from Clover. But there is something revelatory about these monsters. Almost a warning or a judgment. So there we go. The Cloverfield films. A triple-decker universe within a multiverse seeking the elusive balance between order and chaos. And in the process, monsters are unleashed across history. But it's not entirely without hope. In the Cloverfield franchise, it's ultimately the human relationships that matter. Go to your husband and your children. Kiss them and love them and know how blessed you are to have them in your life. That's all there is. Maybe that is all there is in the cold, uncaring multiverse of Cloverfield. But what about our own reality? I'm inclined to think that our families and friendships point to something even greater, something fundamental. My name is Thomas Thorogood. Thank you so much for watching. On this channel, I talk about the deeper meaning of movies, so do subscribe if you'd like to stay in the loop. And why not leave a comment uh, below if you have any thoughts on Cloverfield? Do you agree with my thoughts? Do you disagree? I was absolutely blown away by the response to my Scream video. Thank you so much for all those comments and insights. And if you're interested, I'd just like to draw your attention to a zero-budget sci-fi horror film that I made. I finished it around Christmas time. It's called Musical Statues. It's a short feature, so about 45 minutes. And that was partly inspired by films like Cloverfield. So I'll put a link on screen and in the description as well. And I will be back soon.